Hello, David McMillan here, former smuggler and survivor of almost 40 years, taken, arrested in some of the worst prisons in the world. And if they were too bad, well, I'd often escape. And I want to talk about fear. And at the moment, that seems to be something that's worth talking about. In the early days of my smuggling, I would be my own courier and of course there was fear in the danger of the operations and some success in overcoming that fear. How? Well, I would do the calculation of what I thought was a good scheme, a good method. I would travel the world's airports and see, take in as much as I could. Just knowing about something helped to overcome any fear, and the fears were considerable. Often, life sentences or a death penalty, and usually bad treatment by the authorities, especially in source countries, where the police have a free hand. That can generate fear. How did I deal with that? I'm quite sure people are born with a certain amount of fearfulness or not. People often speak about uh, a low resting heart rate, that is, the heart beats slowly, and those people often have less fear than others whose heart beats 88 or higher, all the way up to hummingbird level. Somebody with that level perhaps shouldn't try anything risky. I made many mistakes when I was first starting out, and in overcoming them, that came with knowledge. I would begin each operation by a calculation of all the points of danger and the method to get through the blocks, through customs. Then I would take a kind of dry run of the journey, go through the actual airports and not be carrying anything but take an imaginary something and see whether it got examined. And doing that, checking every doorway, every timetable, every delay every missed flight, I came to know that all of my calculations were slightly out. So I did them again. And the fresh calculation, that again poured a kind of cool water over any fears I might have had. And that was useful for me because uh, I think I was a born risk taker and I could certainly overcome the idea that uh, it was insurmountable, the things I had to do. When I was about, uh, I guess, 17 or 18, I was arrested on some trivial charge. Well, I say trivial. It was, uh, I was writing myself forged prescriptions for uh, barbiturates. Anyway, I overdid it one day and uh, walked into a trap and found myself back in the police station. Uh, the police didn't make an awful lot of it. I was charged. I, uh, I think I was fined or, or given a bond probation, something like that. But the interesting thing about the whole experience was a very experienced and uh, rather wise old policeman who leant back in his chair and looked at me and said, you know, David, if uh, that is your name, I think you've got a lot of jail left in you. I didn't really like that. I was still pretty arrogant. I asked him why. He said, well, during the time you've been here, I don't see anything that suggests you're scared. You don't seem to be worried. I made the excuse that, well, I can't really control the outcome, can I? So what's the point? He said, it's not that. I've had many young guys sitting in that chair. The ones that are shitting their pants. Often as not, I don't see them again. But uh, people like you, you'll be back. Of course, <coughs> I dismissed that and thought, well, I'll do better next time. But he had a point. Being fearless is not a good thing. It's there for a reason. It's part of rationality. Sure, there are times when you have to overcome it but only when the odds are really in your favour. 
So when I'd completed my dry runs and uh, another thing I had that was an advantage, I had enough money after the first couple of trips so that if I needed to change plans at any point, I could do so without another fear of being trapped into my own plan. And people should think about that. They might have a great scheme and they might have budgeted for it, but they should know that it's much better if you can be halfway through the very best idea you've ever come up with and then realize it's all rotten and that you've got to step back into the shadows in some hotel around the world and plan everything again and have the means to do it. But that helped me too. So by the time I'd made the, all the test trips and did the real thing, I would knew enough about every step and every place to pretty much sit back and enjoy the ride. And I think that helped me too, because I appeared relaxed. But now we come to the couriers. For one reason or another, I was persuaded that it was a good idea. I'm not so sure it was. Uh, and certainly in terms of uh, quantities, it was essential. I just had too much stock to move too much dope from uh, Bangkok to get to Europe and Australia and elsewhere. I needed more people. But here was the real problem. It was one thing to get people to say yes, that was a certain type. But were they capable of it? And by that I mean, would they be the kind of people who could walk through a little barricade of uh, authority figures and not attract their attention? And there are some that do and some that don't. So over the next few years, I was in for quite some lessons in people and what they do. In terms of fear, the best couriers were quite fearless, of course. And why were they fearless? Well, I, it comes to mind uh, Peter Dale, probably one of the very best I ever had. I don't know where he is today. But he testified against me in the end uh, because he was so trainable. He was trained by the police, I guess, as a witness. Anyway, but while he was a courier, he was terrific. Uh, Peter uh, could adopt a new personality. He knew nothing about drugs and didn't care anything about them either. He was entirely self-absorbed, so he certainly didn't think of any consequences his actions might take, any harm he might cause. You know, he was beyond that level in his, uh, in his little fantasy world. And that's how he carried through. A couple of times I asked him you know, why he did so well. Because I'd guessed by looking at him. I always positioned myself so I could see them go through if possible. He was dressed um, in kind of, not exactly tennis shorts, but a kind of sportsman's outfit. And he even carried a very expensive tennis racket. And speaking to him later, Peter told me that he imagined himself as an international tennis pro. And I could see that there was a glowing aura of success and confidence that radiated from him so that as he stepped through the wall of offices, security, customs offices too, the waves of authority just parted because there was confidence in their midst. This was not a person who would be jeopardizing this great life that seemed to emanate from him, not for petty things, not for narcotics, not for a few thousand dollars, no. But there weren't too many Peter Dales in the world, and I had to find a way to help regular people, if I may call them that, as couriers, get through that fear barrier. And I bring this up now because there's... Uh, well, I don't know when you're watching this, but there is a pandemic, and with that comes some fear. And there is a relation to this fear idea, because fear is universal. Back to the couriers. First of all, I would take a new courier on the trip, on the journey. Uh, if it was leaving from Sydney or London, they would leave from there, and I would be with them. Where their fears came into play was in source countries, perhaps Bogota in Colombia, or Bangkok in Thailand, particularly, uh, especially Asia. I suppose it's true that the more 
alien to one's own experience, the more fear there is. So I take them through Bangkok Airport, the streets of Bangkok, the hotels. And what I was doing was directing their attention to the officials, pointing out that they had just people. They have their jobs to do. That should not in itself mean anything. Sure, they had the, the power, the authority of their job, but when would they apply it? And to the couriers, I also kind of deconstructed the authority figures. I pointed out that that uniform was not a weapon in their hands, but it was a shield to hide their probably all too frail human personalities. And they wore their uniforms out of their own fears. Was that true? Perhaps so, at a fundamental level but not entirely true in the course of the events of their job, in which that uniform could become a weapon by scaring people. Yet it was true. Uh, the couriers were safe in a way. Because I was close by, I wouldn't let them be taken away. Oh, if they were taken away, certainly not for long. They always had the option. Very few were ever arrested or stopped, and rarely actually anything to do with the operation concerned. They might, usually when they'd done a few and they had quite a bit of money to spend, they'd run around uh, the source countries and get themselves in trouble. So I'd be bailing them out or otherwise fixing the problem. And often they'd get too carried away with that. But it was nonetheless reassuring for them to know. Some of them became so absorbed in their temporary personalities of fearlessness, they came to reject their regular lives and found it hard to go back to them. I suppose a bit like soldiers who are really only at home on the battlefield or preparing with their fellow soldiers. Civilian life, it's not just that it was dull, it was somehow unsafe because the knowns they'd trained for weren't there. And it was the same with the couriers. Once I wasn't around, who would protect them? They had money, but that was new to them, mostly, anyway. But now, let's widen this a bit and look at fears more generally, and as they are at the moment. There are those who might uh, rightly or wrongly look at me with utter contempt and say, well, David, you manipulated those people. You gave them an artificial sense of security. To your own ends, you built a world around the careers that was uh, not only unreal, but didn't apply to anywhere else. But they really didn't see it that way, and the good ones all retired happily and looked back upon those experiences as well. Even so, I do think that it has some lessons, uh, some preparation for fear. The current fears are, uh, well, they're two or threefold. There's a fear of catching COVID-19 and dying from it. Or there's a fear of not catching it now and having to wait until that day comes when you do. Then there's a fear of ruin from the various lockdowns that have destroyed your business or put you out of work or left you vulnerable to home life and, well, once you've finished doing the gardening and building little things around the house, what's left but to argue with the others in the house or, if there's no one in the house, begin to argue with yourself. That could be worse. Then there's the fear of what's coming next. And as I used to try and impress upon the couriers, the change is always for the good, and even if the economy isn't so great, for every change in it, there is opportunity. And we don't know what those are exactly at the moment, but if you observe, you will find them. And here is the opportunity to do just that. Observe. If I can keep some of the analogies with the smuggling operations, then we can say that what's important with the virus is knowing the facts, knowing the surrounds. 
And the facts are that all the operations of government and the lockdowns is in no way a cure for it. Sure, there's research for a vaccine, but that is quite some time away. In fact, at the date of this recording, it will be at least two years before you can visit your local doctor or hospital or clinic and get that vaccination. That's kind of a long time. It might be developed in a few months, but you won't get it. It'll take longer than that. Now, what will you do in the meantime? Will you be able to work? Do you really have to worry about it, actually? So, here's another fact. It probably won't affect you. Even though there are great movements around most countries at the moment to prevent people passing it on, the sole reason, just remember this, the sole reason is not to overwhelm the health services at the same moment. It is in no way uh, a method of ridding the whole gene pool of, well, not even the gene pool, but the whole human world of the virus. It's out there. That genie is out of the bottle in too great a numbers to uh, make it just go away. So all the work that's being done now is simply to um, put a tap and steady the flow on the numbers getting it at once and those amongst them needing treatment. But those amongst those who contract the virus, who need treatment of any kind, will be low. Those amongst them that need hospitalization will be low. And why do they go there at all? Principally so they can breathe through it with some assistance, concentrated oxygen or even enforced ventilation. But that pretty much is the entire treatment anybody will get in a hospital. And they don't want everybody knocking at the door at once. It makes sense. But that's all that's about. It's not, it's not a solution to it. It's just a, a moderating the flow. So if you were fearful of it, don't think you're part of a solution to it now. You're not. You're part of a so by adhering to any kind of lockdown. You're you're part of the solution of stopping the health services from being overwhelmed, in the immediate sense. But it's no solution to the virus itself. That solution is within you, and remember the probability that it will actually kill you is very low. <clears throat> sure. What about those? Uh, undoubtedly 15,000 people in the UK already who've died from it. Well, it's true, but in terms of the deaths of, what is it, 600,000 people a year, that's still not very high. And amongst those 15,000, which will be going up to, I expect, about 40-something thousand in the next year, an awful lot of them would have had other problems, underlying health issues, as they say. But here's another thing. Many, many of them will be genetically predisposed to be affected by this virus's progress in its second wave. That is, after the flu-like uh, symptoms go, an autoimmune reaction kicks in. And this only happens with a certain type. Now, you either have that uh, genetic predisposition or you don't. There's really nothing you can do about it. But these numbers, fortunately, are quite tiny. Uh, when I say tiny, I'm thinking certainly less than 2%. I've got a feeling it'll be even, no, quite a bit less than 2% once more is known. Uh, are you happy to take 50 to 1 odds of survival? Well, uh, speaking for myself, that's perfectly all right. I think, I w what would you do um, to improve your life where you had uh, a 1 in 50 chance of dying? Um, would I say dying horribly? And there's a bit of a difference, dying well or horribly. I think, um, fortunately, if you do get a hospital bed and you're going to die, 
it's not really that horrible. It's unfortunate, it's perhaps sad for those around you, but it's not like being tortured to death in some place. It's not like you know, drowning in your own blood from a bolo. There are worse deaths, frankly. And luckily we're in rich Western countries, and you probably are, you wouldn't be watching this, so all our deaths are rather well controlled, especially as we get old. We go to hospices and get filled with drugs and fade on out. So we shouldn't have a fear of that. Not only are the odds against it, but the odds of suffering while dying are quite, quite remote. Is there a general fear of dying? Of course. But what is that about? What is it, this fear of dying? If all deaths were instant and there was nothing else after that, no consciousness, only the effects of your death left upon those of the earth, a fear would be that, I guess, you'd let your family down. Those you love would be left alone. Perfectly reasonable and quite noble fears and concerns. But how often are they the fact of our fear of dying? I suspect it's largely the fear of the unknown. Well, I can assure you there is nothing to fear on that level. When you die, that is it. There is no element in which your consciousness continues. Now there is one in ten trillion or less possibility that I'm wrong about that. And I'll speak on that on another subject because it's a long time. But uh, let's go with the statistics at the moment and say that after death there is oblivion. So it shouldn't really be a fearful thing. I think what we're talking about here is the fear of the way of dying, which certainly in times hmm, only a few generations ago were absolutely awful. But as I say, our deaths are moderated now. They're all manageable. But it's fear of the unknown. Like my couriers used to have a fear of the unknown until I explained to them that everything was known and what the next stages would be even if things took a turn for the worse, were all controllable. So, in the same sense, if things take a turn for the worse and your 1 in 50 chance goes against you, you have a predisposition towards it, uh, and you might die from it, which again is another level of uh, odds against that, then it is controlled. So. Don't fear it. Surely part of the thing that increases the level of fear is that the people from whom we expect things to be made better, our officials, seem not to have as much control. They line up pretty much every day at a conference and the kind of Spartan lectern, simplified warning signs, in the UK, rather like the kind of warning signs that uh, of a road diversion or a big hole in the road. Uh, probably not the best choice, but they line up and mm, pretty much give instructions. But they do seem that they're not in control of it. And that is a fearful moment when the people that you expect the most of turn out to be quite hollow, that they're not in control. All they seem to be able to tell you is steady now, don't all rush at once. Nothing else, no solution. Don't rely on them so much. Distance yourself from the authority figures, our leaders, as a source of comfort. If you become more self-reliant and you don't expect too much from them, you won't be so scared when they reveal themselves as either incompetent or simply without a plan. They're not entirely incompetent, but uh, their plans they're developing on the fly, as it were. And the cruel thing is, of course, it was all so utterly predictable years ago that the warning signs were there to prepare it. 
I would say this. If you want to reassure yourself, placate some fears, keep an eye on the newly built emergency crisis hospitals. Uh, they're called Nightingales in the UK. See if they're in operation. See if they're filling. If they're not, it may simply be there's not the staff to operate the places. It could be they need fine-tuning. But I suppose it's some comfort that they exist, that they've been doing that for a while now, and not entirely being used. So we'll have to take that as a good sign. Ultimately, you have no reason to be fearful of anything, and yet if fear remains, it is that most general of fears, fears of change, fears of going out of that comfort zone, which was never greatly pleasing, it, it never fulfilled your dreams, but even stepping away from it into some unknowns does have a fear element. I guess you... Should you embrace the fear? No. That path leads to a bit of craziness. But do some calculations with your time. Work out what it is. And see yourself, perhaps, if it's helpful. As a trained person, let's keep away from soldiering because there's death behind all of that and lots of guns. We'll have to go with my couriers. Yes, you've been trained to walk through the virus and come out the other side. And so you should. You can dress for it like my couriers did. Not really the masks, but uh, in other ways, a certain amount of dress code. But you can have foreknowledge. And the foreknowledge really here is that almost certainly it won't do you any harm. And examine the evidence before you accept what seems to be coming to you. Because the stories you'll hear from friends of friends of their experiences will rarely be good ones. They'll only bother to pass on the interesting ones or the morbid ones or the ones that involve great pain or before Aunt Mary went she was in terrible agony or perhaps she was just delirious. Now those are the stories you're going to hear there'll be a hundred more of the people who are infected and pretty much never felt a thing. Perhaps you've already been affected, <laughs> affected, infected, and affected, and have passed through it. If you watch this thing in another six months, it could well be the case. You've come out of it fine. I expect to see you then. So fear not. Fear nothing. Somebody's in control. It's you. I'd like to buy the world a home and furnish it with love. Grow apple trees and honeybees and snow white turtle doves. I like to teach the world to sing. Sing with me. just had to end that one on the uh, great Coca-Cola ad from way back then. And I've taken it from the Mad Men series because, well, whether it came as a bit of inspiration from some ad executive who'd uh, had a couple of weekend retreats in hippiedom, I don't know. But looking at that ad now, it's rather spooky as that crowd, as that viral pack expands. 
In fact, the lead singer, although she's meant to seem so Mother Earth and fecund, as they say, she looks rather viral to me, herpistic. But I shouldn't be critical, not in these times. But I will.